program to bring you a special bulletin. This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. Five. Check for sound. Four. It's showtime. Three. Let's two, go. One. Thanks to Rode Microphones and Harlan Hogan's VoiceOverEssentials.com. The home of the Portable Pro. This is the Pro Audio Suite podcast with Robert Marshall from Source Elements and Someone Audio Post Chicago. Darren Robbo Robertson from Voodoo Radio Imaging Sydney. From LA, George the Tech Whitten, the Tech to the VO Stars. And me, Andrew Peters, voiceover talent and home studio guy. Welcome to another Pro Audio Suite. This week we have a special guest from sunny Queensland in Australia, Dan Brum. How are you, Dan? Yeah, good. Great to be here. It's great to have you. The reason we got you on is because you um, have got a foot in both camps, uh, one as a voice talent and one as a production guy, audio engineer. And your big claim to fame is the animated series Bluey, which is seen in about... 80 countries, is that right? Wow, it's 80 now, is it? Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of... I don't know. <laughs> it's really exploded out. I know, probably. Sounds I, like a good number. I haven't checked. That sounds about right. Um, it was in every country except New Zealand for a long time. <laughs> except New Zealand? Yeah, I don't know why not New Zealand, but just for a while it was like every country just except New Zealand for some reason. I think they were doing it to spite you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's look, it's it's kind of exploded around the world at the moment, from what we can sort of tell. Um, which Chevron's pretty stoked with. Like, we didn't really know if the Australianism would sort of translate well to other countries, but I guess it seems to be. Yeah, because aren't a lot of the most successful international shows often language like they don't use spoken language, like they use like you know, like the Shaun the Sheep, for example, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's yeah, how yeah. they succeed in so many countries, right? So. But uh, a show that has, you know, actual spoken English language, things have to translate and make sense. So that's pretty amazing. And then it's Australian spoken language too. So it's a whole other kettle of fish of uh, intelligibility <laughs> right. in other countries. And I think that's one of the beautiful <laughs> things about about your show is the, is, is your refusal to, um, you know, overdub voices into US accents or Kiwi accents or whatever. I um, I heard a story from from Joe talking about getting an email from a mum in the States who said, I love the show, but can you please overdub it because my kids have started calling me mum instead of mom and stuff. (laughs) It's awesome. (laughs) Increase the number of times we say mum in the the script. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Uh, Yeah, look, it was a conscious decision by the producers um, and Joe. Like, I think they just wanted to keep it as sincere as possible. And so much of it, I think, it just kind of wouldn't really have worked overdubbed into... Mm different accents. I mean, in all of the international markets in foreign speaking language, it's all dubbed into their languages. But like in your America and England, it's it's sort of retains its uh, the actual, the cast and crew. We should point out that Joe is your brother and um, and he, he wrote Bluey, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, Joe's my brother. Um, yeah, probably about, I think it was 2016, he... Well, he kind of did a little short pilot for the show, um, which I did the sound for and it was a bit of a different beast, the shows, same characters and names and stuff, and it was the general vibe. And that kind of then led to um, a meeting with Ludo and they pitched it off to various companies. And then we got a little bit of money to make an actual pilot episode, um, which we eventually remade. It's the weekend in series one is the actual episode. We made the pilot and aired at the Asia-Pacific Film Festival sort of pitching day where there's all pitches from around the world kind of and a lot of broadcasters and stuff there to watch it and it sort of blew everyone away there and, you know, broadcasters were pretty stoked with it obviously and it won pitch of the day and from there it got commissioned into a series by the ABC and BBC. Um, As we were making it, like, you kind of knew it was a good show, like it was sort of, it, it was making us laugh, but it was it's it was so different that I'm sure a lot of us kind of thinking, is this going to be a bit too different for children's TV? Uh, so it's been really quite nice to see that, no, people have really taken to it um, and it really kind of exploded in popularity pretty quickly once it was released, actually. It really is like quite things. incredible. As, as we were talking about before we started recording, I've got five kids from 17 down to two. 
Um, and it, as, as, ev fool. Every, every time, <laughs> fool. Every time <laughs> Bluey comes on the TV in this house, whether it be on pay TV, on Disney or on wherever, there's this echo around the house from the 17-year-old all the way down to the two-year-old. Bluey, Bluey! And they all just race to wherever wow. that television is. It's incredible. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, you, know, you, you said something also in the key on is like that made you guys laugh. And I just heard a great interview of Frank Oz. Remember from the Muppets? And um, yeah. he talked about how, you know, what, what, what made what they did so sticky was that it was – it did translate across generations, right? It wasn't just a kiddie yeah. show. And they're like, we knew yeah. – we just were making ourselves laugh. And we knew yeah. it was fun for us. And, and then it's puppets, so that translates to kids usually. So, you know, it, that made it – Work. And the only uh, puppet show that I don't think does cross over would be uh, Team America, but um, that's another story. Okay, another yes, day. there are some exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> I love Team but America. It's funny going it's back just like so <laughs> horrible. <laughs> I love it. It's fantastic. It's <laughs> Can't watch it with the kids around there. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> Matt Damon really scored out of that film. Yeah, that's right. Is is, is there a trick to that, Dan? Is there a trick to? I mean, obviously the writing has a lot to do with it, but in, in terms of when you're recording stuff, you know, do you get to a point in the recording process where sometimes you go, eh, I'm not sure that's going to work, let's change that around? Is, is there a lot of work as you're putting it down as well as in the writing phase? Not so much from me, but like the, you know, the show is specifically a co-viewing show, so it's mm. specifically written to appeal to adults and, mm. you know, it's, yeah, like you said, it's written to make adults laugh and also to make kids laugh. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you do hear, like when we're in recording some of the actors, you do hear the directors and Joe, the writer, who had, whoever's sort of, um, directing the session, you do hear them sort of tinker with lines here and there. Um, but mostly like they've got a pretty, from what I can understand, they've got a pretty rock solid script editing kind of thing. So I think by the point we're recording it, usually the script is like, it's been workshopped and it's, um, it's pretty tight, I believe. Um, but I mean, that's all kind of done before my time kind of thing. I just, I arrive, there's a script there and I don't record all the actors, but I record a few here and there. Um, and most of those things are kind of worked out. And But even when I first read the script, like you go, that's, this is going to be funny. Sometimes I can't quite pick some of the episodes, but the animators know what they're doing and some of them are good visual gags. But you can just read the script and think, that's, that's going to be a funny episode. Because you're one of the characters as well, right? You're Uncle Stripe? Yeah, I, I voice Uncle Stripe, who is the dad's brother. Um, mm. So it's kind of like Art Mirror's life a little bit because the dad is probably based on my brother, I guess, um, and his journey raising his own daughters, yeah. which a lot of the stories are. That's It's kind of about his own life raising his kids. Um, and so I'm the uncle and I've got my little kids muffin and socks in the show. Um, so it's kind of funny. It's like it feels quite real life, a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the um, the lines and things like that. What are you going to do when the kids get older? You're going to have to replace the voices, of, I guess. Yeah, look, I mean, it's it's something we've kind of been discussing for a while. Uh, I know the producers have, have been talking about it. I, I, I don't know where they're at with that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just the reality, right? Like we used real kid actors rather than kind of like Peppa Pig, I think, one of the Peppers was like 18 or 19 and could just project a voice to sound kind of young. But we've used actual real kids, so I don't know <laughs> is the answer. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's like there's some audio tricks I can pull with pitching things up and stuff, but you can only <laughs> – that can only work so far. Well, um, I mean, they could actually grow up in the series. Yeah, they could, but I think the charm is – the age of them, isn't it? But, but Bart's been the same age for quite a long time, hasn't he? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's been a long year in Springfield. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we don't, we, we, we don't really know with that one. Um, yeah, aging the show, I'm not sure. Like, it's a, it's a preschooler show. That's its demographic. So I guess you don't want to age it too much, but... Mm. Uh, right. I'm, yeah. I'm sure these are all the discussions the producers are having behind uh, behind their doors. Yeah. And what about in the recording process then, since you use keeping the Australian dialect, is there any consideration given to are they going to understand this in the States or do you just sort of let Aussie be Aussie? 
<laughs> we, we still have no yeah, we go. Clue. Never go full Aussie. <laughs> what? Well, no, you, yeah. you, know, you know what I'm, I probably didn't phrase that very well. But you, no, I you, do know you, what you mean. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Look, there's there's certainly times when we go full Aussie in the script, yeah. uh, and I'm not sure what happens. But like, I don't know. Is that sort of the charm of a show when you're in another country when they're speaking really colloquially? Um, there's been one episode where I think where we're talking about capsicums, but we did a, an alternate version for the English market where we said peppers. Uh, so there's been, I think, I think that was maybe the one time we did that. But otherwise, um, I don't know, maybe in the script writing process now, maybe they just sort of, they don't do those things. I'm not too sure, actually. It's sort of, it's all usually fairly um, finalised by the time it gets to the audio post-production side of things. It's interesting you talk about accents, though, and I, I, I'd like to wind it back a bit and just um, get an idea of what the discussions were like when, you know, it was decided that this was going to stay Australian in English-speaking markets because it would have been a tough one to get over the line, I'm guessing. Yeah, I guess I, I wasn't there in those conversations, so um, it's hard to say, but I don't know. I guess it's just so key to the character of the show that you retain that Australianism. Like, we're so... It's not a it's not a locationless show. Like we're pretty specific that it's it's kind of Australia and Brisbane as well in a lot of the backgrounds and stuff. Um, and the sounds I try and use are very Australian. All the background birds and things like that. So I guess part of that and a big part of that is yeah the Australian voices in there. Um, but yeah, I wasn't I wasn't certainly wasn't present in the conversations that they were having about whether you do have it redubbed into American accents or English accents or various other kind of things. Is it hard to source the sound effects from local the local animals or the, are there libraries you guys have down there? I mean, obviously we have our huge <laughs> yeah. libraries here, but do you guys have them or did you go out yeah, and no, gather? Yeah, no, good question. A bit of both. Uh, there's some good... Australian ambience libraries, which aren't Brisbane. They're usually Sydney or Tasmania. And I will use some of those, um, but I have. I've gone out and recorded a lot of sort of local ambiences around with little Zoom H5 and a, I think it's an AKG sort of stereo mic. So I'll record out in my backyard. and But it's really hard because like I'm in suburbia and it's just noisy in suburbia. Like you get a nice little break of birds and stuff and then some dude will crank up his mower or a plane <laughs> will fly over or yeah. it's just traffic. So it's it's like it's you think suburbia is this lovely idyllic place, but it's like when you're really listening, it's just so noisy. Some dude's got his TV up loud, four homes down and it just carries and but I've managed to kind of get a, a, quite a few little places around Brisbane, little bush hat mosses and kind of nice backyards and kookaburras in the morning and that kind of thing. And I'll always try and put those into the show and um, that's cool. You know, fill that's it really out cool. with some of my library stuff from Sydney, and I'll try not to use like you know your South African jungle birds or something like that because it sort of <laughs> yeah. would be a bit confusing. Um, as much as possible, realistically, I'm trying to be as authentic to the sound that I hear because I think that's that's kind of that's where we landed when we first started the show. There's a, a lot of sort of back and forth about what the the sonic sort of branding of the show will be and kind of where we landed it's all it's a very real show like the pictures are stylized and cartoony but they're also quite a real looking sort of show so I figure the sound kind of needs to reflect that so all the things the kids play with like the toys and stuff you want those lovely kind of wooden toy sounds and and then yeah the backgrounds you want it to sound like you're in a Brisbane or an Australian suburb particularly for people around the world who haven't been here or that, like, we've got pretty lovely sounding birds and I just kind of want to put them there. And most people probably won't notice any of that because it's mixed pretty low, but you might just kind of get this vibe that it feels familiar if you're Australian. And that's what I'm after anyway. It's really funny talking about kookaburras because I remember as a kid, which is going to date me horribly, uh, but there used to be a, a Tarzan TV series that was an American series back in the 60s, I guess. And every time it, the show was on, it was always a kookaburra in the in the jungle with Tarzan. <laughs> <laughs> Bizarre. 
Well, that's funny because I, I always put him in and the director at the moment, Rich, is New Zealand and he's like, ah, it sounds like a jungle. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> because it does. It sounds quite an exotic sort of bird. But it's like when you live in suburban Brisbane, you just get woken up by those little things every morning almost. Yes, indeed. Uh, going back to the accent thing, I do remember the first um, Mad Max movie uh, with Mel Gibson. Oh, yeah. When it was released in America, it was overdubbed with American accents which was slightly ironic. Right. Mel Gibson, he's, he was overdubbed in the American release. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask, how, how is the recording process? Do you do an ensemble record? Is it kind of an individual script capture? Because you said you were working with kids, so, you know, i just curious what, what, it, what sessions look like. Yeah, look, it's, it's all um, a little bit different. I, I don't record all the voices. I'm sort of a bit too busy doing the sound for the show, but I'll record... Um, some little side parts and a lot of the pickups from mum or other various characters. It's always just one actor at a time. And if it's a kid, we'll have the director in there and the director will read the lines and then the kid will parrot it back to them. Because, you know, obviously the young kids can't read scripts and that sort of thing. But what we've found is the kids are just so good at really copying the intonation and pitch of the director um, with always with maybe a little quirk or something where they'll mess up the pronunciation of a word or put a wrong word in its place and that ends up actually sounding quite funny and quite natural and invariably that's kind of the line that might end up in the show. It's authentic. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, like it's, when you're recording the kids, it's, you strap yourself in because it's like you've got to be quick and efficient because uh, mm-hmm. you don't have long, for, with their attention, you've got maybe half an hour before they're just kind of not interested so much and they've just lost their focus a little because, yeah, they're kids. It's sort of understandable. So, like, my job is just to make sure as best I possibly can that things aren't peeking out and that sounds all right, but you sort of, you're really hesitant to ask for a retake you know, if they bump a mic Because you, or... you want to get through the whole script first and then you can ask for retakes like later, but but you want to move well, forward as much as possible. Yeah, but like even that, you sort of, you, you just have to, as the mixer of the show, I can sort of hear little things that are happening in the session and go, oh, look, I can just fix that or I can RX that or... Um, look, like the thing is, even... What I've learnt anyway is that fidelity isn't super important compared to performance. So if the kid has read a good line but they've kicked the mic or they've been off mic, it's it's like you always sort of stress, oh, it's going to sound terrible and it won't sound thick or rich. But if it's a good performance, no one sort of notices and it ends up in the show and you do what you can to make it sound as good as possible. But... Um, it's just not so important. Like I think with this show particularly because the writing is so strong and it's so fast and there's such great music and beautiful pictures, you can hide a lot of audio sins in there and people just kind of, a, a, they're caught up in the story and I guess that's the point of a sound designer's job is to make people not notice the sounds and just kind of enjoy the actual the show or the film or whatever it is. It's like True. so many things in the world of, of, of effects, whether it's visual effects or any kind of special effects, a lot of it is to not be noticed. Like you put all this work into it to not take any attention yeah. from the... That, that's the yeah. compliment. Yeah. When someone says, did you notice that? And they say, no, you're like, sweet. Like I was, I was believable. <laughs> you bought it. <laughs> right. I know. I use that analogy all the time with folks. That's the real challenge of this show. Like it's not exactly complex sound design, but it sort of is because it's like... You're trying to make a simple thing sound convincing. Like it might be a tower of blocks that the kids have built that they've knocked over. Uh, and so you've got to, it's, it's that's the simplest thing, but it's surprisingly hard to make it sound sincere sometimes. Then, yeah, like hopefully people will watch the show and they won't go, that sounded odd, because it'll just hopefully sound exactly what it sort of looks on screen. Um, sometimes it's hard. The simple things, it's actually quite hard to sort of make something sound simple. Or or have something sound like it really sounds. Like the classic example is like, you know, not that these are on the show, but gunshots in person never sound as impressive as gunshots in the movies or in <laughs> yeah. certain you know, like shows. <laughs> yeah. So so you're, you're conditioned to expect a gunshot to sound a certain way. So now you have to actually yeah. put in the hyped up version of something. Have you found that you've had to sometimes put things in more amped up than, than like the, you know, 
you capture the real sound. And it's like, ah, oh, that's like I have to mess with it and make it sound more impressive. Sort of, yeah. Like, you know, there's not too many gunshots in a, in a kid's <laughs> yeah. animated show, but I, like I get the point. But particularly, yeah, with blocks, like the blocks falling over, I always found visually on screen, you see these, you know, they're building little small blocks. And so you'll build a tower with small blocks in my sort of foley room and you'll knock it over. And I, it just sounds so thin and so sort of very hard transients and there's nothing to it. So you, you have to always find you have to use much bigger kind of blocks and the weight doesn't quite translate into my recordings, and, but it does sort of make it sound more believable. Um, so, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time at the start of the show, wasted a lot of time, I think, trying to be too real with some things and uh, in the end you end up cheating little bits and pieces here and there just for the sake of the show. Yeah. What's totally. the funniest bit yeah. of foley that you've used to replace uh, or or to add some uh, post? Or the weirdest? Yeah, look, yeah, there's there's been a, a couple of things. I, I try as much as I can. I try and um, either record in my studio or I'll go out in location. I've got a little H five and a four one six, um, and so I'll record things on location. And like, there's one episode, kids set in the supermarket where the kids are kind of running amok, and. Uh, they're slamming a trolley into a shopping aisle and it's like that's a pretty unmistakable sound and surprisingly there's not that in libraries so I, I went down to a supermarket and I found a shopping trolley in a, an empty aisle and I raced and I slammed it into um, into the aisle and a Coles employee <laughs> kind of came quietly. and said, ex, ex, <laughs> yeah, she's like, excuse me, um, what are you doing? Well, like, it's pretty obvious. I'm slamming a shopping trolley into an aisle and recording it. <laughs> um, or another time I sort of, I needed the sound of a council bus um, driving along, one of those sort of new ones with the hydraulics and stuff, and, and I was driving home from work one day and I noticed I was happened to be driving alongside one. So I grabbed my mic and sort of stuck it out the window and the bus just slammed on its brakes. And I was like, oh, yeah, I've got a 416 with a roadie pistol grip and I'm sticking it out the window. It kind of looks like I'm pointing a, looks like I'm pointing a gun at the dude. Oh, uh, shit. <laughs> yeah. So Oops. I'm a bit more careful where I point that thing. A 416, is that the same as a 416? Yeah, I, I, I think yeah. you mean a 416 because yeah, I really have never heard of this microphone six. you speak yeah. of. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is crazy what we do, own. isn't it? I mean, I, I, hearing you talk about wanting to do, um, you know, use the real sounds and the crazy things we do, I, I remember um, in my senior sound designer days at a studio down here called Take Two, I was doing a, a TV mix for a, uh, the Subaru WRX and they used some footage from the rally, um, you know, from from the from the Australian rally in there. And there was a, a WRX that was taking off from the start line, and I wanted the sound of rocks hitting the the, the side panels mm-hmm. of the car, the fenders. Yeah, yeah. so I, I sort of nice. jumped out of the studio and, and found a, a metal toolbox in the machine room, and and walked out the front into the garden and got a whole handful of gravel, and was standing in the studio with the forty one six pointed at the. Um, at the, t- at the metal toolbox throwing gravel at it when a couple of the clients walked in and looked at me strangely thinking, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> 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 they let me outside for five yeah, minutes. Yeah, that's right. They let me out of this dark room for a couple of minutes and look what I came up with. That's right. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, we had new neighbours moved in across the road and he was sort of just moved in. He's out watering his garden. But I needed to th- record the sound of a dog barking, a human dog barking outside <laughs> so what, next with his brand dog? new neighbours barking like a dog in a front yard and <laughs> he didn't make eye contact he just kind of kept watering his garden going what's this fucking neighbourhood I've moved oh, into what have I got myself into here <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so your whole studio is based around a Zoom H5 that's about all I've gotten so far <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. the whole place yes <laughs> that's it yeah Bluey's mixed on an H5 that's it absolutely tell us about your favourite uh, what your, what's your what your, what's your studio What's your tool set that you use the most? Uh, so I've got, um, well, I've got my studio at work and then sort of a home studio. Both are running a, a Focusrite Claret interface. Um, I've got the eight pre at work and the two pre at home. And I sort of, I settle on that because I just, I like the, the preamps. They sound really nice. They've got this lovely air mode, which just, I don't know exactly what it does. I guess it sort of boosts the presence and maybe cuts the lows a little. 
Um, and it just kind of clean. It just it doesn't do anything to my sound, and it, it just sort of does what I need it to do. Uh, and then, yeah, I've got, well, I've got two 416s, I guess. Um, and for the show, though, I use a Neumann TLM 103 for all the actors on the show that I record. Um, I just really like that microphone. It, it just sounds really nice and present, and it's got a, it's not quite as 416 as the 416 is, if mm-hmm. you probably know what I mean. Yeah. Like, it's a, I love this microphone, It's but it's sort of an advertising microphone, whereas the, the TLM 103 just, I don't know, it just it sounds really nice with acting, I think. That's the nicest way I've heard someone put that. It is an advertising microphone. You're absolutely right. Sorry, the 416? Yeah, the 416. Yeah, the 416. Yeah, 416. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's totally, it's like nasty cut through anything. The voice will definitely be heard. <laughs> no EQ necessary. It like almost has yeah. a compressor built into it. That's how interesting the 416 <laughs> yeah, is. Yeah, it's a good way of putting it. <laughs> what about door? Are you on Pro Tools? Yeah, Pro Tools Ultimate. Um, it's sort of, it's just kind of standard, really. It, yeah. It's, it just does exactly what I need to do, and I, I sort of park my version once I get it stable, and it can do everything I need to do. I just don't upgrade my system, and I don't upgrade Pro Tools. But yeah, so I'm running that, and then a whole swag of props that I need for the show, which are mostly my kids' toys that I've kind of pinched from them when they're not looking. Yeah, that's the average sort of process of the show is that we sort of, you know, we, I get the, the, the finished animation and the dialogue and you cut all that together and, and sort of edit that, then, then sort of get that to level. And then it's the sound design process where I either go out and record some sounds or clank a bunch of bricks together and toys together and stuff like that. And then the music comes to me and then we mix it and then meet with the director and um, sort of tweak little bits and pieces and... Yeah, it's a five-day turnaround per episode and 52 episodes per season. That's pretty fast. Yeah, it's, it's, it's only a seven-minute show, but it is surprisingly complex for seven minutes. There's a lot um, in them. Absolutely. Like they're, yeah, they're, they're fast-moving shows and they do a lot of stuff in it, but I've kind of got the workflow down now. I'm 104 episodes in, so I've kind of got the workflow down a bit better. Um, but it is like there's there's no time because like I'm the only audio person, so there's no time for being sick or being away or missing a day here and there. You've really got to sort of you've got to be organised and you've got to be prepared and you've got to sort of just keep on top of things. Um, but in the end, like it's a really great show, so it's it's just super fun to work on and you know stressful and it's hard work and all that sort of thing as you'd expect, but. Uh, like it's just such a joy to work on this show because it's it's just so well written and the the music's so great and the visuals are so great. So it's playing my part in it. Like, do you try to be topical ever? I mean, like you know, I think of South. We mentioned South Park, so I'll bring it up again. But yeah, that's their thing, right? They're very very topical. Yeah, Is a show for kids. Like, can be can it be topical? Do you go there? Well, I think South Park can be topical because they. You know, they they produce an episode a week and then it airs the day after it's finished. So they can be topical, whereas there's a bit more of a lag with with Bluey. Like, you know, we need to sort of finish the whole season before they air. So topical. Oh, gotcha, um, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's for kids. I, I guess kids aren't so interested in modern topics, I suppose. Right, um, right, right. I Weird mean, the psychology just... of the show from... <laughs> no, no, I, I totally understand... Um, but yeah, I think the show is basically just about kids play and the various ways that kids play. So sure. I guess it doesn't need to be too topical. It's timeless. There's no kids holding iPads on the show, I'm assuming. I think there's iPads <laughs> yeah, on the well, show. Well, no, there's... there is a few episodes actually. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of makes a joke of it sometimes. Um, but yeah, there is a few iPad episodes. It's a real, like, it's a very real slice of life. And I think that's why it sort of resonates with so many people. It, like you're seeing, as parents of young kids especially, you're seeing your story on screen and you kind of, I think you feel validated a little bit. Like we're, we're playing all these games behind closed doors at five in the morning for hours on end. So I think it's nice to kind of, you see it on screen and you're like, ah, that's, that's me too. Like it's not just me doing this. And what's it like working with your brother? Yes. It's, I mean, it's, it obviously <laughs> has its moments. Um, I think 
when you're brothers, there's no, not necessarily any politeness um, <laughs> that you reserve for working with colleagues. Yeah. Um, and when the brother is your boss, it's it's a little bit less. But um, he's incredibly talented, Joe. So he, he kind of he always knows what he wants, and so it's. Yeah, it's you learn a lot just working with him. Um, even about sound, like he he because he just know he writes this thing and he directs this thing or used to direct it, so he kind of knows what he wants every element to sound like and to look like and to feel like. And yeah, so you just you, knowing him pretty well. Obviously, being his brother, you can kind of you sort of know where he's coming from with certain things. But yeah, like it, it's yeah, look, it's a it's a good working relationship. It's. Um, had a few little irks in the in the first series, but it, it's it's uh, we're still we're out. still brothers and we're still friends. <laughs> I think <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we've spoken before on the show about the client fader, the good old client fader that goes nowhere. Um, can you get away with that with your brother? <laughs> uh, no, like that's the thing. You, it always sort of you, you think he doesn't know sound because he's an animator, but invariably. After the fact, you look back and go, "Damn, he was right." <laughs> like he's, it's, everything he said yeah. is exactly how it needed to be. Because you know these animators and these directors, they they know these. They 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 live and breathe the scripts, and they know exactly what they want it to sound like or feel like. Um, and if you haven't captured that, then it's not going to work in the episode. Is he your older brother? Out of interest? Yeah, he is. I got I got I got three brothers. He's the middle brother. It's a spin out. Like, uh, yeah, I work on the show, but then to see the success of the show and think, God, that's, my brother has created this. It's, mm. it's, uh, you really, it's, it's amazing. You, you really, I'm really proud of him. Yeah. Always kind of knew he'd probably do something like this. Like he's, a, he's always been a really creative and um, pretty well-driven sort of person. So I was kind of, I thought a series like this might come out of him, uh, but I don't think you could have expected something that's been as popular as, as this show. Did you know it would be a kid's series though? Or did, did it could have been just about anything? It could have been about anything. Um, I mean, just before we did Bluey, we did a, I guess it's more of an adult series um, called Dan the Man, which is, it was a web-based thing. Probably back in 2008, we did a pilot. It was kind of like, it's set in the world of an old sort of Mega Drive platformer game like Wonder Boy. Um, and the show is kind of about the psychology of the person that's playing the game and the, the sort of the choices you make as a, as a game player. And we made a little pilot episode and it went pretty viral on the internet and uh, it's fairly adult, obviously. And, uh, and then Half Brick, who make Fruit Ninja and um, Jetpack Joyride, who also are based in Brisbane, they got on board and we sort of turned it into a seven-part animated web series that followed a story and then the seventh episode dropped you at a cliffhanger and then Half Brick made Stage 8 because it sort of already was a, a video game. And so then you played Stage 8 on your um, on your phone. And it's a great little series because it's, it's quite adult in its humour and it's sort of set in a medieval environment with dragons and jetpack ninjas and it's it was kind of this great world, particularly as a sound designer and I did all the music as well. Like It's just like every great sound effect you want to put in is in these episodes with AK-47s and explosions and massive big all-in brawls. And um, So, yeah, that was certainly more adults, but uh, I think just he... He was going through these years raising his two young kids, so I think a, a kid show was probably quite a natural thing that he wanted to to express. So the other interesting thing about the show for me, uh, and I'm sure for everybody who listens to this show, is that the father character, Bandit, it is actually voiced <laughs> by the lead singer of a, a fairly well-known Australian band. How how did that all happen? <laughs> yeah, well, look, that's... That's so great. We, yeah, when we were doing the pilot, we tried a couple of sort of dad characters and uh, and then Daly, who's one of the executive producers of Ludo, who the producers of the show, he works with Dave. Dave runs Sonar Music in Sydney or is one of the co-owners, I'm not sure. This is Dave And McCormick he said, oh, why don't you try... Yeah, Dave McCormack from Custody. So why don't you try Dave McCormack? Um, and oh, God, I was a huge Custard fan growing up like my brother was. I think it's the first band I ever saw live. So when you got him on, like, A, it's cool that he's from Custard, but B, he's just got this great voice that was just so perfect for the role because it kind of sounds comic, but it, it's not comic. Like, he's just got such great character and he, he really brings the bandit character to life, I think. Um, and I think it's a great nostalgic trip for a lot of the fans of the show, the parents, who 
that was kind of the music they listened to. I think they really sort of dig the fact that, um, yeah, he's the custard front man. Yeah, I love it. And the, and the other really cool musical thing is that um, this week in Australia, from what I understand, uh, the soundtrack album for Bluey is actually number one. Am I correct? Yeah, number one on the ARIA charts. Yes. Um, yes. It's amazing. Wow. I think number one on US as well. I, I thought oh, I'd wow. heard the number oh, one kids go. album in the US. I saw some screenshot. That's Joff the composer. He sort of... He's just freakishly talented, um, the scores he come up with. They're just such an intrinsic part of the episodes. And um, and then so he took those little things and really expanded on all the, the episodic sort of themes and scores and stuff. And, I mean, the album's amazing if you listen to it. It's oh, like I've really to beautifully it over written. Over and over <laughs> and over and <laughs> over. Yeah, I'm the same. I'm the same. God, but good. that's the thing. Like, you can and it's still kind of cool. Like, you, yes. your parents dig it too because they're great songs. It's the first kids' album to be number one on the ARIA charts. Oh, really? Which I, I don't nice. know how the Wiggles didn't get that spot. Yeah, I was but gonna say. either way, Bluey yeah. is the, the number one. Yeah, nice. There you go. That's a, I think that's a great accolade for a great Aussie show, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I, that's it. I think everyone's just really stoked about that because everyone's quite proud, I think, in Australia of this show coming out and it's gonna, it's been so well received overseas. Mm. What we haven't asked you, though, is uh, your background because you started off not using your voice. You were an audio engineer and still are, of course. But so where, where did you start? Uh, yeah, good question. I started... Uh, at Nova, 106.9 in Brisbane, actually. Um, they'd just opened their doors and I was kind of, had no experience and I sent a letter to Ben Ryan, who's kind of the, the legendary imaging producer that worked there, and he just gave me a shot and I started as a carding monkey, essentially, just kind of <laughs> shit kicking, basically. But um, when I wasn't carding stuff, Ben would train me in how to use Pro Tools and how to cut radio ads and... Um, it's like a free education or a paid education from one of the sort of radio greats. Um, and then after about a year, I went over to a post house and cut ads for a long time. And that's when I learned what a voiceover artist is because, you know, I was, I was recording them all for the a million retail spots. And uh, I think at one point, I, I never really considered myself in that role. Like, I guess I've got a deep voice and stuff, but I never really thought of myself as an actor and then one day this director came in, Brendan Williams. Um, it's quite a big guy. He comes in. He's like, hey, Brummy, I've got an ad I've shot and I want you to chuck in a voice for me. And it's this really lovely ad for uh, the New South Wales Rural Fire Department with these beautiful images and this really cinematic score and uh, quite a moving kind of copy. And so I didn't know what I was doing, but I kind of got behind the mic and, and voiced this thing. And yeah, the ad sort of blew up and people were kind of patting me on the back a little bit for my voice in it. I guess it just kind of started this thing where it was like, well, maybe I could be a voiceover artist. And then, <laughs> yeah, I, I left that place, went overseas and got back and sort of needed work. So I just went, well, <laughs> now's the time. I'll, I'll give it a shot. And I think it's sort of fortunate that I knew a lot of writers around Brisbane and, and people at hire voiceover artists and we were kind of friends from working at the post house. And so they would kind of maybe at the start they would sort of just give a job to a mate sort of thing and hopefully over the years of that I sort of get jobs more based on ability rather than kind of who you know. But that was about, yeah, about 12 years ago. So it's been quite a long run as a voiceover artist and was freelance engineering all the while and then when Bluey came along I sort of, it's kind of now a 50-50 thing. How do you deal with doing voiceover sessions when you're on a tight turn around for the show as well? Or do you sort of put that aside while you're doing that? <laughs> yeah, it's it's tricky. Um, I mean, the benefit of being an engineer is that I'm in a studio with a lovely booth and Source Connect. Um, a, lot of, a lot of things I record remotely these days, so I can just kind of, um, I can do it at the end of the day or before I start or, you know, sometimes it doesn't take very long. So you just take a quick little break and record a voiceover here and there. But yeah, it can be problematic sometimes when you've got booked in meetings with directors and things like that. But um, so far, it's it's it's. I think the universe has been working in my favour that things haven't clashed too badly yet. Because you you've got the same agent as AP, right? Uh, I'm with Scout. Are you with Scout? Are you AP? I'm with Scout. Yeah, we're both with Scout. There you go. There you go. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. I, I jumped on about 
a year ago, I think. Um, there you go. <laughs> We're both on Scout. Yeah. It must be it must be interesting though. Being uh, now you're doing voiceovers as well as engineering. That when you're doing a session, either as the engineer or as a voice, do you tend to um, start judging the person on the other side of the glass? <laughs> yeah. Look, that's um, it. Does it? I think that's what helped me become a voiceover artist at the start. Like I had no acting ability, nor could I be a voiceover. But I had recorded a million good voiceover artists before. So I kind of, I knew how things were supposed to sound and I knew how you're supposed to act in the booth. So that really helped me kind of transition onto the other side of the glass. Um, But then, yeah, when I record voiceover artists, you also kind of know things that they could be doing differently. Um, Which when I'm recording for the show, I just kind of, I, I, I don't really play that role. That's for the director to kind of decide what they want to hear and they're lost in the world of the script sort of thing so you don't really want to um, interject and say, oh, I think you could have rolled the R a little harder or things like that. But, yeah, it's, 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 I think it's really handy knowing both sides of the, of the studio and the booth. Because you did start off as the audio engineer, I think that's the biggest trip zone for young players is understanding the etiquette of being a voice actor and going in and doing a session. Because when you start, you think, well, they've booked yeah. me for an hour, so I, I better do the full hour. What they want is you to do 10 minutes and piss off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, look, there's so many things you learn like that. You just sort of, I guess you get a, a vibe that's going on. I was always sort of guilty for a while of I knew that I could do things differently or better in my head, and so you would say that. You know, they're choosing their their takes that you've done. And then I would say, oh, I think I could do it this way. But it's like, I should have known. Like, they they don't, they don't want you to, to, to do that. They've, they've chosen their takes and they're happy with the way it sounds. Um, So now I just, I just talk when I'm spoken to and I, I kind of, I follow direction and keep some opinions to yourself. Every now and then, if you sort of genuinely know you can really bring something to the, to the table, you will. But, uh, most often, they just kind of want you to, to do your part. But when it's your own voice, though, you start picking holes in it. I, I mean, I did a session just a couple of days ago, which was a Source Connect session, and they were doing a cut as we were recording. But I would hear stuff there going, yep, that's great, that's perfect. And I'm hearing, ooh, that word was a bit crunchy, or, you know, you know all that kind yeah. of stuff. Where they're not hearing it. You're yeah. hearing it, but they're not. Yeah, I think that's exactly what I mean. I, I think... I think what I'm learning is that just because it can be done differently, like I can do it, do it differently, doesn't mean it needs to be done differently. Like in the end, if the director's happy with the way it's been read, then yeah, I guess that's the most important thing. Now, the other thing we should touch on, I'm sure George would be very happy to jump into this conversation. Um, I think you were the first person in Australia to buy a tri booth. Is that correct? Yes, yes, apparently. Um, that's where I'm recording from right now, actually. Hey, oh, there we, we, all thought we, were, we all thought you were a little bit nuts, but we were really <laughs> glad that you decided to, <laughs> to do it because, you know, it, it, ain't, it ain't cheap to ship one of those things to, to Down Under. Has it been really useful for you? Yeah, it's been good. I mean, like with, you know, I've got a studio in town that's pro-built and stuff. That's where I do the show from. But last year with kind of COVID and lockdown sort of happening, I kind of had to split my workload from home and that. So I needed a good home solution. Uh, And I'm sick of blankets, cushions, that kind of thing. Uh, So this has been great. Like I I, I don't de-pack it up. I've just got it set up where my sort of home computer is. And um, I've got it sounding the way I want it to sound. And it's nice. Like I, th- I think it's a it's a pretty nice sound. Um, so here comes the big question, and, and how much publicity George can get out of this episode comes down to your answer. <laughs> has <laughs> has the tri booth been used on the number one cartoon on the planet? Not yet, because oh, we'd finished George. all the recordings for season two. <laughs> it may well yet. Um, <laughs> There's still time. Season threes, we're ramping up. We're ramping up now. It, it could still happen. I'm sure it will from time to time. Sorry, George, you're out of luck. <laughs> <laughs> it's so amazing. It's just two seasons. You guys are two in the can, and three, it, it's only been that long. And you're seeing all the success. Yeah, it's just well, incredible. Yeah, end of 2018, we released the first half of the first season. So that's what two and a little bit years. Um, 
I just what I mean. Like it just kind of, it really kind of exploded in popularity pretty quickly. It's like 80 countries. Um, I was thinking, oh, they've been doing this a while. You know, this has been seven, eight years, 10 years. Yeah. That's just incredible. 80 countries full on. I, I don't know whether you can speak to this, but I, I, I work on a podcast for Telstra called Hey, Guess What? And one of the guests was actually your brother, Joe. And um, they were talking oh. about how the show started, obviously, and, and how it came about. And the story that I love and the story that I took away from it was he talks about the, the, the pilot that you were talking about that you first played at that international show. He's talking about trying to animate one of the characters holding onto the chain of the swing at like two o'clock in the morning <laughs> when it was still, when they were still trying to get the idea together. And, and he talks about how he struggled with it and he couldn't get it to look right. And eventually he got the shits and he threw his hands in the air and, and said, screw this, forget it. I'll just go back to being an animator. And, and, and it, this is all too hard. Walked into the kitchen, got himself a drink, was coming back to turn the computer off and go to bed and thought, I'll just have one more crack at it and got it right. And, and, the show's gone on, but the, the, the thing I love about that story is how close sometimes we we come to doubting ourselves and just throwing it all away and, you know, the, this whole yeah. sliding doors thing, how, how different our life could have been. Yeah, I haven't heard that story, but, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, like, the, yeah, it's, it's just a, like it just surprises us. Like the, these stories just seems like... Uh, like it, just, it was just a fairly simple show we, we thought we were making at the start, uh, but now, like, just the popularity, like I'll drop my kids at school and just so many parents kind of every day they want to come up and talk about the show with you and sort of tell you how much it means <laughs> yeah. to them. Yeah. And it's like it's it's like you're getting a warm hug from strangers. Like they're just they're so appreciative. And I'm like, I'm just I'm just a sound designer. Don't don't uh, don't hug me. But it's 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 really lovely and it's quite nice to have those conversations with just so many people because this show in such a short amount of time like it's it's really quite affected people quite in a you know positive way quite happily and also quite emotionally like there's some really f- fairly heavy emotions in some of the episodes um and people pick up on all those and i think that's the kind of the beauty of the show and the the writing of the show is that yeah it's really funny it's punchy but there's also a lot of fairly powerful kind of um emotions and topics in there and stuff well, and the other fact is you're sort of also guests in our house two or three times a day as well. So we, I guess we sort of do sort of <laughs> yes. feel like we know you a bit. That's the thing. Yeah, maybe. That's probably right. It's really interesting, isn't it, with that sort of success when you think about the Wiggles, uh, when they kicked off as the Cockroaches, when they were just a rock band doing the pubs in Australia and having a couple of hit singles. Oh, is that uh, right? But, wow. Yeah, and then, you know, the band basically fell apart. And I, I've got a funny feeling that Anthony, the singer... I think he went back to uni and I, I think he was, he was studying to be a teacher or something. And then he came up with the idea of the Wiggles and got the band back together and the, <laughs> off it went. And that thing is just enormous. Wow. I saw the cockroaches lying. Yeah. Does that date me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it does well, indeed. There you go. On that note, maybe we should uh, wrap this sucker up. Beautiful. Thanks, Dan. Oh, Great. Thank you. Good yeah, stories. awesome to speak to you guys. This show was mixed by Voodoo Radio Imaging. Edit by Andrew Peters. Using Rode microphones and Source Connect Now. Tech support from George the Tech Whittem. And supported by Harlan Hogan's voiceoveressentials.com. The home of the Portaboot Pro. Yeah.